We are studying Zechariah, one of the most interesting books of the Old Testament. We have finished what most commentators would call section two. The first six chapters are those visions that occurred in one night. We went through all of those and discovered that they are an integrated package. They're a series, but they all relate to one another. We talked about that. And then we had the, the very symbolic crowning of the high priest and all of that in chapter uh, six. Then we went through two chapters that most commentators would call the second section. Shifting from visions as such, it was practical advice that a priest was giving an inquiry team about certain fasts and what have you. Gives rise to some perspectives. And we went through that in chapters 7 and 8 before. Now we're going into the third or final section uh, of the book. The uh, final section is, to, to most people, the most exciting section, 9 through 14. Interestingly enough, the scope of these final chapters is not that different than the scope of the earlier visions, basically uh, covering from the time of Zechariah himself all the way until the kingdom is established uh, over Israel in blessing, when the fasts become feasts and so forth. As we look at this next section, we'll discover it's in two parts also. 9, 10, and 11 we'll discover focus on the first advent of Jesus Christ. It'll deal with other things too, but one of the things that will really emerge very vividly, surprisingly, will be all kinds of subtle issues having to do with the ministry of our Lord when he was here on the earth in the gospel period. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 will deal with his second advent, the shepherd king coming to rule. Very, very exciting chapters. 9, 10, and 11, his first advent. 12, 13, and 14, his second advent. One of the things that I have not dwelt on because I didn't think it would be a fruitful, a fruitful allocation of time is the textual criticisms that have, that have arisen from skeptics. Because, first of all, in the book of Zechariah, they are pretty specious arguments. They're easily dismissed. I didn't want to waste time on that. If you really recognize the integrity and the unity of the whole book, those so-called Deutero-Zechariah arguments fall apart. They're really not uh, given much credence among conservative scholars. Most of the commentators, conservative commentators that deal with this book have suggest that much of the material in this section will often have a double application. Some of the prof- prophetic passages will deal with events immediately ahead of Zechariah, And others, at the same same time, will also focus on things that are far yet future. Many of the applications will really be what we call a double reference. In the first eight verses of chapter 9, we're going to discover that the career or the campaign of a very interesting guy is uh, prophesied. One of the most interesting characters to emerge on the world scene was a young man that at the age of 19 replaced Philip of Macedon and became the one that we know today as Alexander the Great. He ruled from the age of 19 and in 11 years he fell on his bed and wept because there were no more known worlds to conquer. In 11 years he extended his empire all the way to India. Alexander the Great. Fascinating career. His successes will be highlighted in the first seven verses. And his unusual, the unusual circumstances that occur with respect to Jerusalem will be dealt with in verse 8. So that's a quick warm-up. Let's jump in to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 1. We encounter a word that occurs a few times in prophecy called a masa, or a burden. A prophetic oracle, oracle that has a heaviness to it. The burden is the way it's typically translated in your English Bible. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach, and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. A kind of clumsy rendering in the English, but what it has in view here is that what's going to happen will be recognized widely as the action of the Lord, even though it happens through people, is really sort of the flavor of it. Now, this word Hadrach is, occurs only here in the Old Testament but has now been identified by most scholars as Hadarika, which is mentioned in the annals of the Assyrian kings as an Aramean country near Damascus. 
and Hamath, against which uh, Assyria campaigned in three different times, 772, 755, 733. In other words, the 8th century before Christ, the Assyrians were attacking this area, and we find this referenced in some of their materials. Uh, there's a reference to Hadrach in the 8th century B.C. steel of King Zakar, and uh, he attests to its influence as a name for the, hint, the whole hinterland region of Phoenicia. It was a mystery for many, to scholars for many, many years, but uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the whole area of the behind the Lebanon, anti-Lebanon mountains, from Damascus to, and South Syria all the way to North Syria in the region of Arnad. So it's a broad area there at this point, considered fairly well-defined uh, scholastically. Now, as we, whenever you encounter Damascus, keep your eye on Damascus. Isaiah 17 deals with Damascus being totally destroyed in a way that's never happened. Damascus is the oldest continually inhabited city on the planet Earth. And many Bible scholars keep an eye on Damascus because they believe that it, you know, if the Syrians keep messing around here, it's possible there could be a nuclear event. And Damascus has a destiny from Isaiah 17 to be a ruinous heap in the English of, uh, of Isaiah chapter 17. But we'll keep moving here. Verse 2 continues, And Hamath shall also border thereby Tyrus and Sidon, though it be very wise. Now Hamath was the principal city of Upper Syria on the Orontes. It was Antiochus Epiphanes that renamed it Pephania. Now we're going to get into this whole business of Tyre, called Tyrus in your English Bible typically, but it's the city that most of us know as Tyre. At the Battle of Isis in Southeast Asia Minor, this occurred in about October of 333 B.C., Alexander the Great inflicted a defeat on the Persians, the Darius and the Persians, and he threw open Syria and Israel to his lightning-like uh, uh, tactics. And uh, he, had a, he had a blitzkrieg type of style. He, did some, he was a great general. He did some very interesting innovations and in military tactics that literally let him conquer the world. By opening Syria and Israel, he also opened Egypt uh, to his victorious army. So he's going to be coming down the Mediterranean coast What the prophet has in view through these opening verses is the defeat of the historic enemies of Israel. That would be Damascus, Hamath, and the cities of of the interior of Syria, and the cities along the Mediterranean coast, which stood in the conqueror's way for his victorious sweep towards Egypt. Now, Alexander, the prophet, sees Alexander here as an instrument of the Lord. And uh, some interesting things start to occur. Let's get to verse 3. Uh, Tyre, Tyre has been described as being uh, very, regarding itself very wise. That's, putting it un- that's an understatement. Verse 3, Tyrus did build herself a stronghold and heaped up silver as the dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Tyre was on the coast, but what it did is it moved out to an island just off the coast, built a fortification, a wall with 150 feet high, it regarded itself virtually as impregnable and uh, became very smug, very arrogant, very complacent, regarded itself as very wise. It also amassed enormous hordes of gold and silver, very wealthy place. It was the exemplar of the materialistic world. Um, And uh, we find an interesting passage in Ezekiel 28, And I suggest we pause. I think we have time to sort of work this in. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel, writing long before uh, Zechariah, Ezekiel wrote during the Babylonian captivity. Zechariah is, of course, after the Babylonian captivity and the in the post-exile period. But going back to Ezekiel, reading his writings, in in Ezekiel 28, it's a very important passage. We won't go through it in detail, but just to get the flavor of it. Ezekiel 28, verse 1, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And he goes on to talk about, the, about Tyre and the prince that's behind Tyre. And I won't go through the whole passage. You can read it pretty straightforward to get the flavor of what God is saying to Tyre. But what happens is when you get to about verse 11, 
Something strange happens to the text. You need to be sensitive to this. It may strike someone who's first exposed this as a little strange idea, but it occurs several times in the scripture. And what happens is the writer, the prophet, is looking, using the occasion of talking to Tyre, in this case, and pierces behind it, through Tyre to the power that's behind Tyre, and you suddenly sense that the scope of the text goes far beyond Tyre literally. I'm not talking symbolically now, don't accuse me of that. But verse 11 says, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now the language there is pretty superlative. In other words, you seal up the sum. In other words, you're the ultimate limit of what? Of wisdom and you're com- perfect or complete in beauty. That's quite a statement. But we notice we'll quickly discover. Next verse. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And he goes on. Question. Was the king of Tyre ever in the garden of Eden? No. The person that this is looking to was. Who would that be? Satan, Satan exactly. This is one of two passages like this. Isaiah in chapter 14 does the same thing when he's talking to the king of Babylon. You go through chapter 14 and you get to verse 12, you'll discover it goes beyond the literal king and talks about the, the origin and the career and the destiny of none other than Lucifer or Satan. Same thing happens here. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel. It goes, that's, it goes through the whole uh, business here. In verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Rather quaint old English for saying you are the anointed cherub, not just an angel, a super angel, the highest form of a cherub that was in charge. So he was number one. He was in charge. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was created until, tragic word, until iniquity was found in thee. And then it goes on. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Easy to remember. 14, 28. Once, twice, the other. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 are the classical passages having to do with the origin of Satan. Now, Ezekiel does talk a great deal about Tyre, but lest we get too far distracted, let's get back to the Zechariah passage and try to uh, deal with that there. The word Tyre, by the way, is, a, is from the Hebrew tzor, which means rock. The Greek equivalent is turos. And uh, what's involved here, by the way, is an intentional pun. Because we will find in this verse the word matzor, or bulwark, or citadel, or ramparts, Matzor and Matzor are, in effect, it's a pun, from rock to a citadel. And uh, the word Matzor comes from the root Tzor, to besiege. This all gets interesting as you begin to see what Tyre is all about. It was surrounded by a wall 150 feet high from around this offshore island fortress. Very, very impregnable place. The Assyrians, under Shalmaneser, besieged it for five years and got nowhere. They finally gave up. The Chaldeans later, under Nebuchadnezzar, besieged it for 13 years in vain. So the pride and the self-security of the tyrants were very proverbial. You say, gee, how can they hold out that long? Well, see, they're at sea. They're right at sea, so they get to be fed by ships. It's It's a very difficult thing to lay a siege on a city like that. They thought they were impregnable. Well, verse 4, Behold, the Lord will cast her out, and he shall smite her power in the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. So we've been through the Assyrians, five years, no score. The Babylonians that followed, 13 years, no score. Alexander the Great shows up, and in seven months, he took the place. Seven months, not years, months. How did he do that? A couple of things, a highly coordinated operation. The old city of Tyre was rubble offshore. He took that rubble and built a causeway. He built, he moved the land out to the city of Tyre, what we would call a causeway. He also arranged for navies from other city states to join him in this venture. So he did from the land, he built the causeway, and from the sea, he hit it with ships, and in seven months, they crumbled and he burned it to the ground became a legend throughout the ancient world because of what he did here. And this wasn't the only exploit, but it was one of the big, big achievements 
of Alexander the Great. So what happens then? Philistia is to the south. They are in panic. Verse 5. Ashkelon shall see it in fear. No kidding. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. These are four of the five major capital cities of the Philistines. Very familiar to you uh, from your biblical studies, I'm sure. One of the w- names that is missing here, if you're familiar with the five cities, is the city of Gath. And it turns out that was probably about this time incorporated into Judah. And we find that in Amos 1 and Zephaniah 2 and Jeremiah 25 make allusions here. Now Gaza, the key city, held out for five months. The king Batis was finally taken, uh, strapped to his chariot, dragged to death. 10,000 of his best were slaughtered and the rest were sold into bondage. They didn't mess around. Verse 6, And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Now, this word bastard could simply mean foreigner, by the way. The, the word is mamzer in the Hebrew. Uh, but it's an interesting word because it comes from a root meaning to alienate. And I don't want to make too much of this, but I think it's interesting because it's possible. It's a remote conjecture, but it's possible that this might have me imply a Rephaim or a Nephilim. If you remember from Genesis 6, those strange offspring didn't happen just before the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says also after that. So some of us who seem to be particularly tuned to this kind of thing lately are wondering, we like to watch the Rephaim in the Old Testament. These are these giants that were derivative of the strange goings on of like, in, like happened in Genesis 6 that both Peter and Jude talk about it later. And, uh, you, you know, from our whole briefing on the Nephilim, you know what I'm talking about. If not, uh, we'll move on. <laughs> Spooky stuff. Spooky stuff. Verse 7. And I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remaineth, even he shall be for our God, and he shall be as a governor in Judah and Ekron as a Jebusite. Now this blood out of his mouth, and so what what it really means is they will turn from their idol worshiping ways. And I won't get into the details, but they're obviously idol worshiping. They're going to shift to that to be for the God of Israel. And when he says, like, uh, like the Jebusite, there were a remnant of, certain tri- of some of the tribes of Canaan who were incorporated into the commonwealth of Israel uh, during the time of David and Solomon. You'll find the, uh, uh, in 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Kings 9 make some references of this kind. So Philistia is predicted here is to become part uh, of the people of God and will, will share in the blessings of Israel both in a local sense then, but also in an ultimate sense in the millennium. This is one of those verses that probably has both in view. But then we get to verse 8, interesting verse. And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall uh, pass through them any more, for now I have seen with mine eyes. You say, gee, what's that all about? Well, here we have an interesting record in Josephus, in his book, The Antiquities. Book 11, chapter 8, he describes the whole move of Alexander in this period of time. Alexander, as he was attacking the Philistines, asked Jerusalem for, uh, for food and stuff for his soldiers. And Jadua, the high priest in Jerusalem, refused to accommodate Alexander because he had given an oath that as long as Darius the Persian was alive, he was committed not to support Darius's, or Darius, however you prefer, his enemies. And so Jadua uh, declined to uh, support Alexander. You could say this was politically uh, incorrect, because Alexander was on the winning side, he was growing here, he was defeating everybody, but Jadua stuck to his guns. He'd given his commitment. This is called integrity don't see much of it today, but it's interesting to see that that was one of the traditional values in the past. Alexander's reaction to all this was a rage, and he threatened severe punishment on Jerusalem as soon as he got finished with Tyre, uh, after it had fallen, and he'd reduced the Philistines' uh, strongholds, he was going to give them what he felt was their due. Now, Jedua, the high priest, ordered the population in Jerusalem to make sacrifices to God and pray for deliverance. Because on the one hand, he was being true to his oath, but he could see that, so to speak, as we say, the handwriting on the wall, he knew he could be in big trouble here. 
They prayed to God for deliverance with special sacrifices. In a dream, Jadua was told by God to go and meet Alexander in a very special way. When Alexander was coming near the city, Jadua put on all his priestly vestments. He had all the other people wear white, and they went out to meet Alexander. Not in fear, but in welcome. And this whole procession went uh, uh, out there. And when Alexander saw the way they were dressed, he saluted the high priest and expressed adoration for their God, the God uh, Jehovah. Because he, it turns out he saw this himself in a dream back in Macedonia. And he recognized that what God wanted him to do is to recognize these people. He, Jadua then presents Alexander with the prophecies of the book of Daniel. Now remember my Daniel was written in the Babylonian captivity. That was, call it, more than a century before. But it lays out the career of Alexander so vividly that Alexander recognized himself in the prophecies of Daniel. We're talking probably the prophecies in Daniel 7 and 8, for those of you that want to dig into that. And I was going to dig into that tonight, but I've got some other places I want to go, so I'll let you do that on your own. In Daniel 7, uh, Daniel sees a, um, a series of visions, and one of these is like a, a leopard, technically a panther, but a leopard. Um, Fly, a winged leopard flying over the face of the earth. He has four wings. And it turns out this is all amplified in chapter 8 of Daniel with some other visions, but basically um, it, it, it speaks, first of all, to the lightning speed of Alexander and also that he was carried, so to speak, by four key generals. And when Alexander finally dies in Babylon um, later uh, in a, on his deathbed, these four generals are there and say, Who do you give the empire to? And he says, Give it to the strong. And you can imagine what happened. Those four generals divided the empire to four parts and spent the next several centuries fighting with each other. And so the two, um, Lysimachus and Cassander take two other places, but Ptolemy takes Egypt to the south and the Seleucus takes Syria and what have you. And Seleucus and Ptolemy are fighting then for several generations. That gets all laid out in detail in advance in Daniel 11. In fact, it's in such detail that the critics have said that Daniel could not have written it, must have been written later. The problem with that theory is most of this was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born. I won't get into that whole argument now. We'll get into it in another way here in a minute. But the point is, is that whole scenario is laid out in amazing detail in Daniel 11. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting. This is a matter of history, how, De- how Alexander the Great uh, saw himself in Daniel's prophecy and so forth. It's interesting here, the text is going to shift now to Daniel chapter, I mean Daniel chapter 9, verse 8. It's going to shift from that conqueror, Alexander. The text now shifts to another conqueror or deliverer with a very, very famous passage. But before we get into the passage, I'd like to go ahead and uh, take you into four verses in Daniel chapter 9. And I'm going to resort to some graphics here in a moment that may help. It, many people come to me and are interested in Bible prophecy. Chuck, where do I start? I know my Bible pretty well, but I've never really studied prophecy. Where do I start? One of the most amazing prophecies in the entire Bible are, is four verses that were given to Daniel by the angel Gabriel. They constitute the last four verses of the ninth chapter of Daniel. Those of you who have your Bible may want to follow along with me. Daniel is in prayer. He knew that the, he was a slave in Babylon. He knew the captivity was about over because he read in the scripture that the 70 years were about finished. He, because God, he knew it was coming, he prayed for it. There's a lesson right there. He prays for the captivity to be over. And that prayer is interrupted by Gabriel. Gabriel is always on an errand. Old and New Testament, he's always on an errand having to do with the Messiah. That seems to be his job description. He gives Daniel four verses. And I'm going to take the trouble to diagram it briefly because if you understand the structure of those four verses... They constitute not only the most amazing prophecy in the scripture, they also lay out a structure around which all of the prophecies about the end time will fall together. If you're straight on Daniel 9, everything else will fall fall into place. If you're confused about that, everything else will be a muddle. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, we have the famed 70 weeks. It's in four verses. 924... Verse 24 is the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 deals with 69 of these weeks. 
Then there's an interval, and then the final week. Now, when I say week here, what all the scholars recognize is these are weeks of years. That's a strange idiom to you and I, because we think of, when we think of weeks, we only know weeks of days in our culture. But the Hebrews had weeks of days, they had weeks of weeks, Shavuot, they had weeks of months, and they had weeks of years. Six years you plowed the land, the seventh at Laiho, there's a Sabbath for the land also. So this concept of week of years was a standard idiom, 70 Shabuim, if you will, in the Hebrew. Verse 24 gives you the scope of the whole thing. 69 of those weeks of years will be dealt with in verse 25. The last week will be dealt in verse 27, but between verse 25 and verse 27, there's verse 26. I'm not being flippant. There are some specific things that happen after the 69th week is over and before the 70th start. That's a tip-off to something that's not obvious, that those 70 weeks are not, not contiguous. There's 69, an interval, and the 70th. Once you grasp that from the text, not from me, don't believe anything I tell you, check it out for yourself, but when you check out the uh, verses, if that becomes clear, then everything else starts to have some incredible implications. Verse 24, 77 are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city. Not the church, this is to Jews. This is a Jewish prophecy. Daniel, 77 are determined upon thy people. Who are Daniel's people? Israel, right. And upon Jerusalem, the holy city. To accomplish these things, to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now as you skim this list of six things, it doesn't take a profound theologian to recognize that these are pretty comprehensive. And the question is really, has this happened yet? Have we finished the transgression? I don't think so. Have we made an end of sins? I don't think so. Not so you'd notice, right? <laughs> and we could argue about what these others mean, but the point is it doesn't take any insight to realize whatever these things are, it isn't completed yet. They're still, it's still unfinished. That's the main point I want to make at this point without getting into all the background here. This is verse 24. The next verse, verse 25, is going to deal with 69 weeks. The angel Gabriel says to Daniel, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Daniel is in Babylon. It's 200 miles roughly to the east of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's been in rubble for 70 years, almost 70 years. He knows they're about to be freed. The angel says, From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem... Not the temple, Jerusalem, unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. Mashiach, we recognize, the Messiah. The word that's translated prince in your English Bible actually comes from the Hebrew Nagid. It was first used of Saul. It's prince, but not the way we use the term. It's prince in the sense of the ruler. You follow me? It's king is the term that we, we, it should really be translated. Now, to the Mashiach Nagid. From that commandment to that event shall be seven and three score and two, that is 62, weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. Now if you have a study Bible, it may have a footnote saying, gee, there's, four different, there's three different decrees that fit this. Wrong, there's actually four. But the point is, if you study those carefully, three of those four have to do with the temple. Only one decree in history gives them the authority to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. See, what happened under Ezra, Cyrus gave the general order, they got permission to go back home to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And they got hassled, they didn't get anywhere, it was frustrating, a whole hassle, that's what the book of Ezra deals with. Nehemiah rises as the cupbearer to the king, the Persian king is on top of all of this. He gets permission from his boss to get the authority to rebuild the wall so they can defend themselves and make some progress. So he had the decree from, by Artaxerxes Longimanus, to rebuild the wall. And he, when he gets that piece of paper, he rides immediately, and he gets there at midnight, and it, before dawn, he inspects the city, he gets things going, and the book of Nehemiah deals with the successes of that period. What we have here, then, is a mathematical prophecy. From the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid is a period of time. What period of time is it? It's 69 weeks of years. You'll discover if you study the Bible carefully in Genesis and in Revelation, they deal with years as 12 30 day months. See, that's kind of weird. No, that's what all calendars before 701 BC dealt with. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, you'll discover all ancient calendars prior to the 7th century BC dealt with 360 day years. Something happened to the orbits, and I won't get into all that here, that caused all calendars to change. The Romans add four and a quarter days. 
uh, the, the, everybody, dealt, everybody dealt with it a little differently. The Hebrews add a month every so often. They do it seven times in a 19-year cycle, a very strange way to do it, uh, to get back, to get the solar calendar in sync with the sidereal calendar. They all have their different ways of doing it. But you'll discover one of the interesting insights of Sir Robert Anderson, he was knighted, uh, in 1894, he published a classic work called The Coming Prince in which he unravels all of this for us, and I'm using his dating to go through all of this. If you take 69 weeks times 7 times 360, you get 173,880 days. What Gabriel is telling Daniel is that from the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid shall be a very specific period of time. Now, the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, we know what that is. That was the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus which was given March 14th of 445 B.C. And the background of all of this is in Sir Robert Anderson's classic work. It was out of print for uh, many, many years. As a teenager, I had a friend that gave me a copy. It was hard to get, and it was a rare book in those days. But it became uh, popular again and is now available in any Christian bookstore. Sir Robert Anderson, uh, The Coming Prince, gets into, into all the background. I went to the Royal Observatory to go through all the mechanics to date all this stuff. It's all there. Anyway, moving on. The question is, okay... That's when this thing starts. The terminus of this 69-week prophecy is the Mashiach Nagid. Now we got a problem. When did Jesus allow himself to be worshipped as a king? Anybody who's read the Gospels is familiar with it. Several times the crowd got excited. They went to take him as a king, and he slips away. John 6, verse 15 being one case. There's lots of others. He always slips away, and he always says, Mine hour is not yet come. How many remember that? Somewhere in the Gospels. Okay. Now, one day, Jesus does something bizarre. He not only permits it, he arranges it. He tells his disciples to go to a particular place, give these guys a password, they'll release a donkey to you. He takes that donkey and deliberately rides it from Bethany up over, going westward, up the backside of Mount of Olives, down through the Kedron Valley, into Jerusalem. We call that, we celebrate that, we call it the triumphal entry. Strange label when you really understand what's going on here. Now, it turns out that Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 is a verse that if you take nothing else from the study tonight you'll want to remember. Zechariah 9 9, can't miss. In that passage, Zechariah says, or God says, he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout! O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now we all recognize that. In fact, the, the Gospel of Matthew even quotes this verse in support of that event. This is not one of Chuck Missler's contrivances. Matthew points, links it up, that this verse is fulfilled in what we call the triumphal entry. Okay, so far? The place that I'd like you to note in your notes to check this out, there's several, the triumphal entry is mentioned several times. The account in Luke is perhaps the most detailed. It's interesting, in Luke chapter 19, the disciples give him the donkey, he gets on the donkey and they have their palm branches and they lay down the palm branches and all this stuff, and as they're going... <coughs> In ver- we, we find in verse 38 of chapter 19 that the crowd, bear in mind, get the picture here, we're in Jerusalem, it's Passover, it was one of the three feasts, actually Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but they, they lump it together, it's one of the three feasts that every male was com- required to attend if physically able. There were three of the seven feasts of Moses that re- was required attendance, this was one of them, which meant that Jerusalem was crowded with pilgrims. Lots of strength. They'd all heard about Lazarus. They're all excited. And here comes the Messiah on this donkey. They sing Psalm 118. Now, how many have heard the verse, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. How many have heard that? We apply that, we sing it and what have you, to every day. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's not what it refers to. It's part of Psalm 118. It refers to this day. We'll see how important this day is in a minute. But anyway, they they just quote one verse here in Luke 19. It says, saying, Blessed be what? The king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're quoting Psalm 118, the Halal Psalm. But the point is, every time there's a possibility that you and I as Gentiles might miss the significance of a verse... 
the Pharisees come to our rescue. When they get upset, you know you're missing something, okay? They come unglued and they say to Jesus, Master, rebuke your disciples. See, they're taking for granted that the disciples, by singing this psalm under these circumstances, are declaring him the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. Surely he doesn't want his disciples to be blaspheming. And I always love the Lord's very tactful reply. In verse 40, he says, he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And of course, with my peculiar turn of mind, I wish they'd shut up for just a minute to see if this was a figure of speech or did that. Anyway. <laughs> now, the point, and there's, we, we, as you can probably tell, I can go on for hours on all these little things. I'll try just to give you the highlights to, get the, to submit this in. So it turns out that if you understand the dating, and I won't take the time to prove all this, it's all in our notes. If, you, if, if this should be reviewed for you, if it's not, you can find we have a briefing package with two 90-minute tapes and detailed notes and diagrams and background material on just this subject called the 70 Weeks of Daniel. Or if you have the Daniel commentaries, the tape commentaries, they have, the, they have all the notes and things. Uh, or there's other ways to do it. But I encourage you to really make a commitment to yourself to understand this passage is very important to you. Now, the point is... The dating of the triumphal entry uh, can be nailed down to April 6, 32 A.D. for a number of reasons. But here's the interesting thing. From 445 to 32 A.D., 445 B.C. to 32 A.D. is 173,740 days on our calendar. And by the way, if you take the algebraic difference of those, remember there's no year zero, so you'll be one year off. Just a, if you, those of you are going to play around with this. From March 14th to April 6 is 24 days. When you go through the rigmarole to unscramble the leap years... You got one, you know, one, year, one, one day for every four years, and yet you got to subtract three for every century. It's complicated, but you go through all that. That's 116 days. When you add up 173, 740 plus 24 plus 116, you get 173,880 days. Question: What was Gabriel's margin for error? Zero. Gabriel told Daniel the exact day that the Messiah would present himself as a king to Jerusalem. So no wonder Jesus arranged that. Jesus arranged everything that week. Jesus arranged his arrest in the garden that night. They had planned not to take him during the feast day, but he lets the cat out of the bag that night at the the supper by letting Judas know he knows the plot. So he panicked and tells his benefactors, hey, it's tonight or never. So he forced their hand. He's controlling the timing because he was going to fulfill several hundred details that night. The six illegal trials and the whole routine, you know the story. Anyway, pretty fascinating prophecy, especially since LXX is the symbol for the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. In 285 B.C. in Alexandria, the Jews who spoke Greek, not Hebrew, unless they were a rabbi or something, one of the scriptures, their scriptures, the Old Testament, in their language. So they impaneled 72 scholars to translate the Torah and the other, the rest of the Tanakh into Greek. The result of that work is available in four different manuscripts available to us. It's called the Septuagint, fancy word meaning 70. That was finished about 270 B.C. So this document called the Old Testament, including the book of Daniel, was in black and white three centuries before Christ rode his donkey. How did he arrange that? How did he arrange to be... I mean, you can play with that one on your way. Most incredible prophecy. Now, one thing I, did, I slept over, I didn't take the time. The 69 weeks are 7 plus 62. The next verse is going to... Uh, a verse later is going to talk about... After the 62, it means after, since you've already got 7 and the 62, the next verse will talk about what happens next, in effect. Oh, wait, one other thing before I go any further. In Luke 19, verse 41 and 42, the narrative continues. As Jesus was come near, he beheld the city of Jerusalem. Picture him coming up from Bethany, those of you who have been there. You're up in the brow of the hill. You're going to go down the road through Gethsemane, to the, down through the Valley of Kidron, through the temple area. As he comes over, he sees Jerusalem lay out in front of him. What does he do? He weeps. He weeps. I thought this was a triumphal entry. That's our label. What does Jesus say? If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, 
the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hidden from thine eyes. They missed this day. What day? The 173,880th day. And he says, by the way, now ye are hidden. National blindness is pronounced upon Israel here. Is that blindness forever? No, it's not. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, they're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What does that refer to? The church. Exactly right. There's a number. When it's complete, the Father will say to the Son, go get them, and that triggers a whole history yet to happen for Israel. Very exciting. But then Jesus says something else in verse 43 and 44. Jesus continues, he says, For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And we all know that 38 years after he said this, the Roman legions under Titus Vespasian laid siege to the city of Jerusalem for about nine months, during which they sealed it off, It was a war, viciously fought war, in which over a million, some estimates say a million and a half, inhabitants, men, women, and children, were slaughtered by the Romans. During that war, the temple caught fire inadvertently. Some Roman soldier threw a torch through one of the windows. The interior caught fire, which was very gold-laden. The gold melted, and uh, Titus, who had hoped to keep it as a trophy, had to give the unfortunate order to take it apart stone by stone to recover the gold. And literally, not one stone was left upon another. The fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Question, test question. Why did Jerusalem fall in 70 A.D.? There's lots of geopolitical answers you could give. Let's look at the answer Jesus gave in the rest of verse 44. This all happens Why? Because thou knewest not the time of your visitation. Do you realize that Jesus held them accountable to know Daniel 9? Now, four disciples come to Jesus a few weeks before this event and ask him about his second coming, and he gives them a confidential briefing that goes two chapters. It's recorded in three of the Gospels, called the Olivet Discourse by most scholars. And in that briefing, he points to this passage as the key to all prophecy. So you need to spend the time, if you're serious about your Bible, about what's really going on here. Now, the next verse after this is an interval. After the three score and two, we've already had seven plus three score and two, shall the Mashiach be karat, executed, but not for himself. And the people of the princess shall come, this is one of the titles of a future leader yet to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary... And the end thereof shall be with the diaspora, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. This is verse 26. Now we've looked at, up to the end of, cha- verse, uh, uh, end of the 69th week, the 70th week is the, is the subject of the next verse. We haven't gotten there yet. Between 69 and 70, there's verse 26. It's an interval. What happens in that interval? At least two things. The Messiah is karat, or executed, the cross. It's amazing to discover. In the Old Testament, it predicts that the Messiah will be killed. But not for himself. And also the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. And indeed the Romans did that. There's at least 38 years so far. We've discovered from experience it's been closer to 2,000. This interval is still continuing. There's one thing that Paul tells us in the New Testament was hidden, in the, hidden from the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 3, he points out that the church was not revealed until after the resurrection. And it was Paul's privilege to reveal that in Ephesians chapter 3. You can read the first half a dozen verses and understand all that. It's fascinating to see these Old Testament prophecies. You'll find this interval more than displayed, many places. How many places? 24. 24 places in the Old Testament you find this interval alluded to. Okay, but then we get to this strange period, which is known to scholars as this final seven years. And uh, I'm going to suggest to you, I'm not going to get into that particular period. That's a whole other study, but that last verse uh, deals with a week of years that is divided into two halves. I believe Revelation from chapter 6 to 19 is a detailing of what transpires during those seven years. And if you understand the structure of the last verse of Daniel 9, everything else falls into place. We're at 69 weeks. I believe that 70th week is going to start not far away. 
I'm not saying next week. Could? No, it can't quite. But the point is, um, it's, it's coming, uh, I believe. I wanted to throw in a review of the 70 weeks in here for two reasons. Because of the significance of verse 9, it is far more significant than simply that it points to Jesus riding a donkey. Behold, thy king, not a king, thy king Israel, is coming unto thee, and so forth. And that's, of course, been fulfilled. He is just in having salvation. I can give you a concatenate word, all kinds of verses in the Old Testament describing that he will be righteous and just. And, of course, he has salvation, and he's humble and lowly. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. There's plenty of verses. They'll be in the notes. Let's move on to see if we can finish up the chapter here. Verse 10. Now it continues with events that are subsequent. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and uh, from the river to even to the ends of the earth. Speaking of the millennial reign of Christ, you notice from between verse 9 and 10 is also this implied interval. Because we've shifted from his first coming and riding the donkey to where he's millennial, he's reigning on the earth, etc., and as I say, this unseen interval occurs 24 times in the scripture. Anyway, the rule of the Isaiah shall uh, remove all the implements of war from his people. That's also mentioned in Hosea chapter 1. And by the way, his rule is going to be over the entire earth, but centered in Jerusalem. The Gabriel, the same character we've been talking about, told Mary that he will inherit David's throne. And I'd say that many, many churches across America are mixed up on this point. They think that they, they deny the reality of the kingdom uh, commitments that God gave Israel. God is not through with Israel. Paul spent three chapters in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, 11, hammering away that God is not through with Israel. The great tragedy of much of this uh, uh, tragic theology is that it denies Israel its role in God's plan. No, he's coming and he's going to take David's throne, which is a political throne. Verse 11, And as for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit where is, there, where is no water. You can study the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, the Mosaic covenant in Exodus 24 and elsewhere, and, and even you can even, some people, scholars can make allusion to Joseph. Remember when Joseph was put in the pit with no water? Genesis 37, there's all kinds of prophetic overtones, but we're going to keep moving. Verse 12, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Now, this double portion you'll discover if you go back to Deuteronomy 21, if you were the firstborn in the family, you were entitled to a double portion. As you divided up the state, the firstborn got, firstborn got twice as much. There are three brothers, you divide it into four parts, gave two to the first, and so on. In other words, you always give a double portion to the firstborn. That was the basic rule, unless he forfeited through some misdemeanor. You'll find that recorded several places, but the, the reason this gets relevant here is if you look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, you'll discover that Israel is viewed by God as his firstborn. The word firstborn confuses many people. It sounds like he necessarily was born. Jesus is the firstborn. It's not a business of being born. It's a term of position. It's misleading because we think of firstborn means he was born first. What it really means is the one that's in position, a favored position is what the word really means. And Israel is looked upon as in a nation as God's firstborn. So it's entitled to a double portion, and that's the allusion here. Verse 13, when I have bent Judah uh, for me, filled uh, the bow with Ephraim, and raised thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. Again, part of this millennial, things are going to be great kind of passage, but I want you to notice something. Do you notice there's Judah and Ephraim both there? There are no lost tribes of Israel. That myth uh, is a tragic literary myth from a misunderstanding of Scripture. We've talked many times about that. You'll discover that it's a myth in Scripture. You'll see that both Judah and Ephraim are reunited uh, all through the Old and New Testament. But moving on. It says, Thy sons will be stirred. This is probably an allusion to the War of the Maccabees from 175 through 163 B.C. when uh, one of the Seleucid rulers, Antiochus Epiphanes, slaughtered a sow on the altar and erected an idol in the, in, in the Holy of Holies, creating a technicality called the abomination of desolation that so incensed Israel that under the Maccabees, these sons, they led a revolt which successfully threw off the yoke of the Seleucid Empire. The third year after that desecration of the temple, they cleansed the temple, destroyed the instruments that were, that were um, desecrated, made new ones, and that rededication of the temple 
is celebrated as Hanukkah to this day by the Jews. It's also sanctified by the Holy Spirit in John chapter 10, verse 22, surprisingly enough. Hanukkah is actually mentioned in the New Testament. That surprises many. But it all has to do with this issue and that, that technicality that Antiochus executed is pivotal to understanding Jesus' remarks to his disciples in Matthew 24. Uh, we've covered that, so this is just all by way of review. Verses from 13 to 17 really seem to deal primarily with the conflicts and victories of that period of the Maccabees, 2nd century B.C. And also Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, and also Daniel chapter 8 has a whole bunch on this. Verse 14, the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall, and shall go with whirlwinds from the south. A whirlwind from the south was very violent. They came up from the Negev, and it was a, an idiom very, uh, very powerful. The, uh, the sounding of the horn is the shofar, it's the curved horn of a ram. It's used as an instrument of alarm, and it's also ceremonially. We won't get, spend time on that. Verse 15, the Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as uh, through wine, and they shall be filled with bowls and as the corners of the altar. The Lord is going to defend them. For the background reading here, I encourage you to read Psalm 2, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a discussion among themselves about all this. Verse 16, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. In that day, his people will be his jewels, his crown, his ensign, his banner, his pride, and his joy. This is where they're protected by their shepherd. This is where, in fact, Psalm 23 fits, or Psalm 100 in your notes. You can take a look at that at your leisure. The idea of Israel being called his jewels is an idiom from Malachi 3.17 and elsewhere. The fact that he's an ensign occurs in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11.11, you can easily remember that is where Isaiah tells you, when, when I regather them the second time, that's, it's all over. The first time he regathered them was after Babylon, where all this is going on. When's the second time? Started at the end of the 19th century. has been climaxed in the reformation of the state of Israel on May 14th of 1948. And so as we muck around in Middle East politics, we are mucking around in a piece of real estate that God has declared as his own does not belong to the Palestinians. It does not belong to the United Nations. It belongs to him and him alone. And he's very jealous over that. And as we see this all coming to a crisis, watch out. It's going to get exciting. Verse 17, For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. Various idioms of rejoicing and gladness. Great is his goodness. Boy, indeed. So ends... Perhaps a little quickly, uh, Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, next time we'll be taking chapter 10. We'll be getting into prophecies that increasingly will impact you and I. We're going to see some amazing details out of the New Testament uh, cast by Zechariah five centuries before the fact, and we'll be watching that over the next few verses. When we get to 12, 13, and 14, we're going to see, you'll think you'll be reading the book of Revelation in parts. It's very, very dramatic and and very close, very exciting. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Okay. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just rejoice along with the words of Amos 3.7 that you will do nothing but that which you reveal to your servants, the prophets. We thank you, Father, that you have laid out in advance history before it happens. Not that we might know it in advance, but rather that when it happens, your name will be magnified. We thank you, Father, for the incredible encouragement and visibility of just who you are as we discover you alone know the end from the beginning and have declared it in advance. We thank you, Father, for these prophecies, for they're so encouraging. We thank you, Father, for the awareness that everything is coming, everything that's coming, has been ordained by your hand that you are indeed in charge. And that even your enemies, even the forces of darkness, inadvertently, are fulfilling your will and will ultimately bring glory to your name. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement of your word. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together to study this word. Father, we would come before your throne asking you to 
reignite in each of us a hunger, a passion for your word. Instruct us by your Holy Spirit. Illuminate the scripture that we might better understand your heart, Father, and what you would have of us in these days. That we each might be more responsive to your will in our lives. That our conduct might be presented to you as an offering of praise. Not that we might earn anything, for we know, Father, your Son has done the whole job and paid the whole bill for us in advance. But we do ask, Father, that you would help us to present our bodies a living sacrifice to you. Help us, Father, not to be conformed to this world, but to be renewed daily, moment by moment, by the renewing of our minds. That we indeed might discover, might prove what is that holy and acceptable will that you have for each of us in the days that remain. Help us, Father, to be more responsive to your will and more pleasing in thy sight. As we commit ourselves this night before your throne, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.